<laughs> so let's let, let's talk about this uh, quickly. And I, again, thank you so much. Uh, that's probably the warmest welcome I've ever gotten. Uh, the main question that people ask is, uh, first of all, why was I not invited uh, to Germany to speak about this? And I, I think that's because the truth is sometimes inconvenient. Uh, and when we look at what you've talked about, uh, what we're seeing as a response to this, a lot of things become clear that actually are never spoken, that are never uh, sort of stated clearly out loud that you read in the newspaper, you see in the magazines. Uh, instead, actions are speaking more loudly, more clearly than anyone's words really are. And that's what we've seen, uh, a story that's been told since 2013 in country after country, right? This isn't about nationalism. Forget your flag uh, and think about what's happening to everybody everywhere, uh, even in the United States, even in Germany, uh, even in the United Kingdom, although I'm, I'm <laughs> being generous here. Uh, we're talking about very liberal, what we would like to think of open societies, we see evidence again and again that this kind of mass surveillance, right, indiscriminate surveillance that's just collecting everything off the wires, that's hitting sites like D6, Internet exchanges, uh, you know, telecommunications providers uh, all over the world, is they're actually not effective in stopping terrorism. And yet, despite that, we see more and more political support, uh, not only to continue these programs, to expand them, as you say, to, to fund them to even greater levels. But why is that? And I think the answer there is clear. Put yourself in the position of these politicians. Uh, why would they be afraid uh, of upsetting uh, the United Kingdom, uh, of the United States, these sort of international uh, relations where everybody is trading baseball cards, uh, trading sort of dossiers about all of their citizens' private activities. Or maybe they're saying, well, we won't share Germans' information with you, but we'll share the information of everybody else whose lives connects to Germany or transits through Germany. And this, this is the fundamental basis behind not just mass surveillance, but targeted surveillance. It was never about terrorism. Because it's not effective in stopping terrorism. It's not about security at all. It's not about safety at all. It's about power. Surveillance is about control. It's about being able to see moments of vulnerability in any life, whether that person's a criminal, whether they're an ordinary person. And we want governments to be able to investigate serious crimes, or at least some of us do. This is CCC, so I can't speak for everybody in the audience. Uh, but, you know, if there's a bad guy out there, we can get a court order with this guy's name on it and say, let's go after them. Let's tap their line. Let's go after their modem. Uh, let's go with the alligator clips outside their house. Let's go in their house when they're not there. We've got a warrant from a court. Uh, let's look at this person's life. Very few people object to that. But this, where we're watching everyone everywhere all the time, is an extremely dangerous thing. And I want to point out here that Germany is standing on the stage of history in a real way because they are the only country that has a real inquiry going on. And unfortunately, we see uh, they're operating from a position of either fear, uh, where they're afraid that they'll lose popularity in this sort of international intelligence ring, or favor, uh, where they're afraid to upset a friend, right? which is understandable. Nobody wants to piss off their friends. Uh, but at the same time, there are greater consequences at risk here. Uh, China just passed an extremely harsh new surveillance in December of 2015. Uh, when they were asked why they did this, how they could get away with this, how they could justify this, where it compelled technology companies to help them decrypt communications that were going through uh, their servers. And they said, well, this is what every other Western country is doing. Why shouldn't we do the same? Uh, Russia just passed their Yaravaya package, which is even worse. It's one of the most blisteringly terrible surveillance laws on the planet. Uh, Russians call it the Big Brother law. Uh, this is something that should never be passed anywhere in any country. And yet the same kind of thing happens. They go, well, we're just keeping up. They're not. They were probably doing this anyway. Uh, but the fact is we are now ceding the moral high ground. We're now saying it's OK. We're now saying we're not worried about individual rights. We're not worried about human rights. Uh, we're only barely concerned with the rights of people within our borders, within our countries, with our passports, right? But human life is not this sort of team sport where we go, what color jersey are people wearing? 
Uh, human rights are universal. Even in the United States, people go, oh, well, you know, this person's not uh, protected by the Fourth Amendment or something like that. I've got news for you. We signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These are international agreements, treaty agreements in the United States. And if you read our Constitution, we have something called a supremacy clause, which means our treaty obligations are equivalent to constitutional obligations. So, yes, in fact, foreign citizens, people around the world also have constitutional protections. You don't have to look to the Fourth Amendment. We have a mesh of other frameworks. And my final thing here, just because I know I've gone long, uh, is that this isn't just happening in China and Russia, right? We were always suspicious of them. We always knew things were going to happen there. They were always going to play games on the internet. But it's happening in Germany. It's happening in the UK. It's happening in the US. It's also happening in places like Canada. Uh, Not old news, not 2013, happening now. This is from uh, the very end of October of this year, Right. And it continued through the very beginning of November, where a journalist uh, and in fact, many other journalists in Montreal were found to be uh, being monitored. Specifically, their phones were being tracked via their GPS, via their tower positions. Uh, They were being tracked not because they were suspected of any criminal activity, but because the police department was embarrassed by the stories that were put out that were sourced to people within the police department. So they said, well, if we track the journalists, we can find their sources. And then suddenly their intelligence agency said, oh, people are responding really badly about this. Maybe we should say that we kind of do the same thing. And the Canadian Intelligence Service said, hey, we are going to uh, do a report about this to tell you when it happened and why and how and justify it. But the unfortunate news here is just a few days ago in this month, in December, they said, uh, we're actually going to take that back. We can't tell you that uh, because this is a state secret. And if we get into that paradigm of confirming what's happening, who's being spied on, when and how, we won't be able to keep secrets anymore. Well, the problem with this, ladies and gentlemen, is secret government is necessarily bad government. Uh, You can't substitute the judgment of a few officials behind closed doors for the judgment of everyone in a country, everyone in a nation, not in a democracy. And we can try that. Uh, We can even try to work around the boundaries of that. We can create inquiry commissions like we have in Germany right now. But the problem is we will see fundamentally again and again that that paralysis that's injected into our democratic prof, uh, processes by those natural human inclinations, uh, those sort of uh, buffeting winds that we feel on either side of us of fear or favor that the commission is suffering under right now, where they go, look, what's going to happen if we say we broke the law? Well, we might lose power. We might lose reach. Uh, We might lose prestige. We might become less powerful. We might lose our careers. We might lose our popularity. And ultimately, in democracy, whether we like it or not, uh, particularly in recent days, it seems that a lot of our governments are devolving into simple popularity contests. I I think in no point is this more clear uh, than in the United States, where we just had the most public unpopularity contest in our history. But It's not enough to talk about the problems. It's not enough to talk about the failings. It's not enough to talk about where the inquiry committee is going, look, we can't talk to these people because the United States might be pissed off. If we do that, what we're saying is that our principles don't matter. Our rights don't matter. The structure of our governments don't matter. Our beliefs, our values don't matter. And if that's the case, why are we playing at this game at all? And if that's the case, All of the restrictions that are put on us in this social contract between the governing and the governed, where we play nice uh, in exchange for this vote that increasingly means less and less, means we need to start thinking about what we can do directly. Uh, Again, everybody in this room is here for a reason. Everybody has things they believe in. Everybody has things that they want to learn. And we've learned a lot in the last few years. But perhaps the most important thing and what I think uh, we need to all be considering with is what can we do? We're hackers. We see a problem. Mass surveillance is out there, right? Uh, We can't get to targeted surveillance yet. We've got a really smart guy who's going to be on stage next. I think Chris Segoyan talking about the targeted hacking. 
But mass surveillance was what I set out to let people know about and how we can contest it. But the thing is, all I could do is tell you what's going on. If we're going to make the Internet safer, if we're going to make our societies more free, more open, if the generations that come after us are going to enjoy the same rights that we ourselves inherited, that people died for, you're going to have to do something about it. Maybe that's writing code. Maybe that's creating a tool. Maybe that's starting a new service. Or maybe that's recognizing that sometimes you have to say no or vote a different way. But you have to take some action. It's not enough to believe in something, ladies and gentlemen. If we want things to get better, you're going to have to stand for something. Thank you.